This episode of The Clear Out was recorded on the 9th of August 2023 at home in Wicklow. And it is an episode that goes from saying goodbye to William Friedkin, the great, great Hollywood director uh, whose standout achievements were probably the French Connection and The Exorcist. Um, so part of that Hollywood new wave, uh, just a, such a distinctive voice in American cinema. Uh, he just passed away in the last couple of days. So I share some thoughts on him, his legacy, his movies, the ones I liked in particular. I then talk about uh, a very recent a very recent parenting episode some more um more uh, parenting lessons to be learned um another dispute with my daughter um and i conclude today's episode by looking at seahorse fathers do you know what a seahorse father is so that is a trans man who is pregnant um, or you know a trans man who's a fa- you know, father um, and that was inspired by or provoked by um, uh, a photo a photo essay or a photo article I saw in uh, in the Guardian and I just found myself having a look at quite you know quite a strong response I had to those images um, so I explore that and just look at that language um, and look at my own responses and I just step a toe into that area of of trans rights and trans people um, fighting to be seen and what I feel about all of that and what I think is the, for myself anyway, what I think is the, the, the way forward. So um, so that's what's coming up. I hope you find time to listen and I hope you like what you hear. I'll see you around the corner. Cheers. Ooh, not gonna change my mind Leaving the dream behind Keep my mojo. Hi, my name is Dara Clear and you're listening to The Clear Out. You're very welcome. Welcome to another another episode in trying to work things out trying to make sense of what makes us tick and maybe what also makes us thick to use that very popular Irishism or maybe it's not just an Irishism thick don't be so thick for God's sake anyway here we are another week and would you believe in this really manky manky summer that we're having here in Ireland would you believe the sun is shining today? It's actually um, hitting the the low to mid twenties on the the Celsius scale, and that's um, striking <laughs> because there, there's been very little of that over the last seven or eight or nine weeks. Um, it's been soggy. I took my my daughter and her pal to the river. Um, one of the local river swimming spots last weekend and I'd kind of been telling myself that actually the summer hasn't been too bad um, but when I saw the river that day I was like stop it stop lying to yourself the river was so swollen the current was so strong and the temperature so cold that I had to I had to uh, raise the white flag and go, no, this is really, really poor. Such had the rainfall been so heavy that the river was, yeah, like it simply it wasn't safe to swim in. However, the girls insisted. They got in and they stayed safe close to the shore. I was very impressed with them. They were very tough. I had a tiny, tiny little dabble, a paddle myself beside them. Uh, because I wanted to get in and um, yeah but yeah if I needed any further proof um, to accept 
that this has been somewhat of a write-off. Um, there it was. But uh, but as ever, you just get on with it and roll with those climactic punches. And we could be so much worse. We could be so much worse. We're very, very lucky, I think, to be here in Ireland where the worst you can complain, the worst you can complain about is rain and dampness. Um, I'd prefer that. When you look across continental Europe and you see a lot of countries that are pretty much on fire, I think I'll take this little wet corner um, on the edge of the Atlantic and simply be grateful. Um, are things going to get worse? Is, is, is that your conviction? Are we going to reverse this trend? Is global warming something we can actually have an impact on? Are we kidding ourselves? Is the damage already done? Is it too late? I don't know. And I'm not going to try and answer that now. Um, I uh, I tend not to spend too much time thinking about it. That's the truth. I try to be a little bit conscious of our own consumption habits in, in hashtag blessed, of our recycling habits. I mean, I've heard some people say that, that household recycling makes little or no difference to the overall picture. Um, I haven't flown anywhere in the last... Uh, you know three and a bit years since we've been back in ireland so i haven't contributed to that particular carbon footprint i do burn um solid fuel uh, in hashtag list so but like on what, what level are we talking i don't know anyway it's like a lot of things my personal position is there are other people you know the experts are working this stuff out i'm not going to worry my little head about it um, beyond beyond what I can do in, in, in my own life. Um, does that sound like complacency? It's, um, uh, the way I view it is, it, it's, it's knowing what my corner is. It's knowing where I can exert any influence at all. And that's, that's not my corner. That's not my area. Um, I have no qualms ever about ceding ground to to the experts to the people who actually know what they're talking about to the people who've dedicated their lives to whatever it might be that was my attitude to covid as well i really consumed almost no extra information i didn't go down any rabbit holes i didn't seek out hour long videos or lengthy papers or research or data I just simply accepted that my position was I'll take the jab, I'll take the medication, I'll take what they come up with because I don't have any alternative um, and I believe they know best. They, those people, those people in the white coats. Um, yeah, that's my position because I really do believe it's a, it's a waste of my energy it's a waste of my um, emotional resources to spend time in those places when um, there's enough to be getting on with there's enough uh, there's enough other things to to absorb my uh, absorb or provoke my anxiety or my concern or my fear and I feel in those areas I have more of a chance of affecting change or adapting in a way that's functional and helps me and those close to me that um that is how i try to uh get th to get through this thing this thing we call life so there you go um if you're if you're a new listener you are very welcome indeed very welcome you can join the seven other listeners the ever expanding audience um, I have no, I, I, I don't have any sense. <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Goodbye. I don't have any sense of the the audience for the clear out expanding. And it was funny. I bumped into a friend in uh, in the supermarket in in in, in Rathdrum, <laughs> the local town, 
Last night, Maeve, my daughter and I were on a mission to get custard because I'd made a rhubarb crumble. My brother Danny had dropped off a huge batch of rhubarb from the garden and I said, I'll make a rhubarb crumble, which I did. Um, and I said, we'll make custard. And Maeve was like, I'm not eating that. I don't like rhubarb, but I'll have a bowl of custard. And I said, fine. So when we went to the press, the cupboard, to get the cup to get the custard after dinner there was no custard to be found so off we went into Rathdrum myself and Maeve on the custard mission I was going to show her how to make it anyway I was in there I was in the queue waiting to pay for our little tub of custard and who was there only Alan Clark Alan Clark who I interviewed on the podcast was it around this time last year was that a year ago I think it was around September last year. Alan Clark, uh, my old schoolmate, artist, illustrator, sculptor, and all around good guy. So we had a quick chat and he was um, saying nice things about how I continue to put the podcast out. I, I'm not sure, if, I don't think he listens to it, which is fine. <laughs> but he was saying, oh, you know, I'm very impressed. You know, you, you, know, you can really just keep doing it. And I was making the argument that, um, yeah, well, even if, like first and foremost I get something out of it first and foremost I enjoy doing it and get something out of the 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 sort of the, the transmutation that happens from from doing this from recording and putting it out whatever happens after that it doesn't really matter in a way because I've put myself through the process of sitting down and going on the journey and I continue to derive pleasure and satisfaction, a certain amount of gratification from doing that. And it is and continues to be a creative outlet of sorts. So in in that alone, it's achieving something for me on a totally selfish level. And then I but I, you know, I have faith in what I'm doing. I have faith in what I'm saying and talking about each week. I have faith that it is largely a positive contribution to any discourse or consumption of thought or reflection in the the wellness and mental health and self-care area with additional stuff about movies or whatever, okay? Um, but I was saying to Alan, second, you know, secondly, after all of that, if at some point someone goes, discovers the podcast and they might be in a position to present an opportunity or open up a new audience to the podcast, they can go, oh, this guy has produced the podcast podcast consistently over this amount of time and has a hundred plus episodes. And see that in itself is its own achievement. It's its own record. It's its own evidence. It's a, it's a, it's a body of work. And that says its own thing without me doing anything at all. And to that, Alan replied, well, that's a very good point. And he said that he knew a, a sculptor friend of his from Italy who started a podcast. And he said he was just doing his podcast. Maybe I, I got the impression not as not, not putting it out maybe as regularly as I do. But then he said, you know, and suddenly after 10 years, it took off and the listenership expanded and now he's going around the world been invited to speak here and speak there so um i thought that was very reassuring i just have to um <laughs> i just have to play the long game um i you know I, I i am a believer in the long game just keep chipping away just keep chipping away so it, it's very analogous to, to sculpture in fact just keep chipping away at that enormous block and eventually something something uh, of merit will be revealed something that opens up the door to something else um anyway we got custard and that was fine and we had dessert so um yes that was uh, that was last night's that was last night's adventure um yeah so where 
to begin today, couple of there's a couple of things. There's a couple of things um, I know I want to speak about. Um, maybe I'll just start very quickly with um, an acknowledgement of the passing of William Friedkin, the great, the great director, the great movie director, the great filmmaker William Friedkin who gave us, amongst other things, The French Connection and The Exorcist, probably his two most critically and commercially um, successful films. He also gave us Cruising with Al Pacino. He also gave us To Live and Die in L.A., which I spoke about only a couple of weeks ago. Um, And maybe one of his most un loved or underappreciated or divisive movies um is Sorcerer uh, which I think is 19 I think it's 1977 I'm not sure I'd have to check that but Sorcerer is I think isn't it a remake of the French film Wages of Fear it's certainly based on the French book Wages of Fear and it's I think it's actually a really extraordinary film and told in this almost brutalist uh style a sort of a hyper masculine lean terse um tight-lipped um adventure movie of a of a type and maybe um a story of I don't know if it's a story of atonement or a story of desperation um, a story of of fate and there is something remorseless about it um, and it's got this 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 um, this soundtrack by um it's by Tangerine Dream, isn't it? Tangerine Dreams, this kind of synthy soundtrack. But fundamentally, it's the story of four desperate men uh, who are effectively on the on the run or hiding out in an unspecified part of South America in desperately rough, run-down conditions, doing um, manual labour, for a mining company some under false names and they've all fled something pretty desperate in their in their past um and coming from different walks of life and different convictions um and the we get their their backstory and the the incidents that led them to need to flee and then the the, the motor of the movie really is how they find themselves find themselves with a chance to get out of this situation in South America but they have to transport across you know the worst jungle terrain in old buckety trucks highly explosive highly volatile nitroglycerin um, which can't be knocked around too much so any sudden jolt and it can explode and the idea is to get it across the you know across the jungle to the end of this route which will take it to another mining excavation camp and then they'll get this big payout and can you know they'll, they'll have enough mobility financially speaking to get out of there um and it's i don't it, it's it's i just find it, it it's it's i think it's a compelling it's a compelling movie. Each man has their own motivation, their own reason for wanting to get it the hell out of there. And there's no sense of true friendship or camaraderie. It's just they each have their own thing they have to get done and they're, they're going to drive these two trucks. Um, and probably the big set piece in the movie is the trucks one after the other trying to get across this ramshackle swinging and swaying rope bridge that's suspended in a you know very close to this torrent of raging river water 
and the rope bridge is in desperate condition um, and one wrong move and the trucks will end up in the water and gone um, and it's you know the each cross in torrential rain horrendous visibility uh, and it's just it's it's great like it's this great movie making and that's what reminds you know, what it reminds you of when you watch it is Friedkin was a great director of, of action and there was just this kind of great propulsiveness to the way he directed action and, and that sequence in Sorcerer is a great case in point and of course the the famous the famous car chase in the French Connection um, absolutely brilliant um, and of course the French Connection gives us that probably one of Gene Hackman's all time great performances as Popeye Doyle and the cast in Sorcerer um, probably one of the only recognisable American actors was Roy uh, Roy Schneider Scheider? Schneider Schneider <laughs> Roy Scheider of Jaws fame um, the reluctant uh, the re- reluctant seagoer in Jaws um, yeah uh, and then the other actors were um, I, I can't even name them different European actors uh, maybe an actor from the Middle East um, who whose name I didn't know but um, there's just again if, if, if you're talking about casting men who you know actors who look like men as opposed to men who look like actors if you know what I mean um, so not glam or suave just they look like real men um, and there's just this kind of grittiness and this kind of soiled quality to to the aesthetic that felt very almost you know docu real um, and of course that, that wouldn't have been unusual in, in 70s cinema as so many of those directors em- embraced that kind of uh, new wave aesthetic and I think Freakin in a way maybe more than others really lent into that in a very hard way and I think that's what I liked about him when I'd hear him interviewed like he's just all in there's no holding back um, and you know you look at a filmography like his and you think well if it's only three or four movies that really stand out um, but they're absolute crackers uh, The Exorcist I'm so fond of that movie I love that movie I find it a really um, compelling engagement with with faith with with spiritual devotion with the you know with the crisis of um of belief and with facing fear with facing uh, the idea of satan of the devil and i think uh, you know and features a great a great central performance by jason miller uh, as, as the tormented priest who is already rattled before he comes face to face with the the possessed girl um Ellen, Ellen Burstyn's daughter um, played by Linda Blair isn't it and voiced by Mercedes McCambridge um, and then nice supporting turns by um, Max von Sydow and Lee J. Cobb great great movie just so atmospheric and I'm sure I mentioned before seeing it for the first time I saw it for the first time in London in the the late 90s it was a re-release and i saw it in the cinema and i knew about it by reputation of course but i'd never seen it and wanted to see it and um, to my disappointment the the special effects were greeted with you know laughter and sort of ridicule by the audience um but it you know which which just whatever you can look at those effects and go yeah they can look a bit hokey but overall it's the i th- i think it's the it's the seriousness of the engagement with the the high stakes of the you know the representatives of god taking on this evil spirit taking on the devil and 
what it means to them because that comes across so convincingly and it's that line is walked so convincingly and you have the sort of the skeptics as represented by lee j cobb and ellen burston and um it, it's again I, I spoke last week about adult movies and tar and oppenheimer um and you might think for god's sake the exorcist is not meant to be taken seriously but i think that's its success is that it does take it seriously there's no winking it's not arch it's not raising the eyebrow it's not inviting you to laugh it's saying this is deadly deadly serious and i don't think jason miller did a lot of acting he was i think he was quite a successful uh playwright like an award-winning playwright um and i'm not sure what other acting he did apart from that but he just had the haunted look of someone who who was completely um afflicted by an existential crisis and was losing control um and so as the the protagonist of the movie he was brilliantly complex and brilliantly vulnerable um and just kind of for me just kind of you know got under your skin as you go on the journey with him because he never felt he you know it, it's like the like it, look in a way if you want to make it um make a comparison to a western it's it's the gunslinger who doesn't really want to pick up his gun who doesn't have faith in that idea anymore um and that's jason miller he like if if his his weapon is his faith he basically thinks i don't know if this gun works i don't know if these bullets are going to do anything and therefore he's you know it's that loss of conviction that makes him such a, an interesting um protagonist to get behind because he's going look you know how are you going to believe this how are you going to feel confident in a positive outcome here <laughs> if i'm the guy you're going to you know stake it all on um and of course that's when the you know if you take one shot from that movie it has to be max von Sydow. um i know that's not how you pronounce his name apparently but it's that shot of him stepping out of the car into the foggy lamplight outside the house I mean that is the image from the exorcist um incredibly atmospheric beautifully shot and then it's that thing of going okay this is this is the guy he is the guy who's going to get the job done and the stakes get raised but the devil raises his game as well uh and brilliant just brilliantly 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 directed really really good and um yeah and uh free can i think thankfully he had one late uh late success in his career uh in 2011 he directed a movie called killer joe which featured one of those performances that was part of this you know the, the narrative around matthew mcconaughey and the mcconnaissance at the time where Matthew McConaughey played a very nasty, cynical, dangerous um, local sheriff, I guess, in a, in small town Texas, and this family that he gets involved in and their scams and how he kind of intimidates and bullies and exploits them, with some great performances by um, Thomas Hayden Church and Juno Temple and Gina Gershon as members of that family. Um, but just a nasty, a nasty little piece of work, sort of Texas noir, maybe in the um, now it was, it was. I think that was based on a play by Tracy Letts, but it, it it made me think of the work of Jim Thompson, who would have been the author of um, the Grifters and the Killer Inside Me. Just these desperate and uh, yeah, desperate people capable of anything. Um, and then meet their match in someone who's even more kind of venal than them but that's a that's a movie well worth checking out if you're interested so anyway um william friedkin i mean i tell you what one thing i was thinking about and you know william friedkin i think he was 87 when he died 
I saw something online earlier that Dustin Hoffman is turning 86. And I was like, holy hell, how is Dustin Hoffman suddenly 86? And for whatever, I mean, this is just purely um, an observation of <laughs> you reach a certain age in your life. And I'm sure my parents' generation, so we're talking about the baby boomers' generation, they must have gone through this at the same time in their lives. But I'm kind of looking around and kind of going, okay, so these these iconic figures uh, of popular culture um, are just dying on a you know on a weekly basis, and you know you realize oh well this guy was in his you know late seventies this guy was in his eighties oh she was in her eighties, and you realize okay so it's that age, um, so when I was when I was growing up these people were in their prime are producing their best work or their most successful work um and these are the people who loom large as your well okay i speak for myself they were looming large as i you know engaged with the world of of movies for me movies particularly but music as well um and you know they're part of the the, the constellation of key figures in art making um and i realize now i'm at an age where they're all dying and i guess that is a that is something everybody must go through where you go okay so the world as i knew it is no longer going to be it's no longer going to exist and these people who felt iconic and meaningful um, and massively significant to me they're going to be gone and other people, their successors, they're not going to resonate in the same way with me. They're not going to resonate in someone of my age in the same way. And it's um, it does it, like it, it it feels it does feel like a sort of a an impoverishment and a diminishment of of the world as uh, well as, as I know it and think of it. Um, so I find myself reflecting on that and going, okay, so how do you, how does one deal with that? How do you deal with that? Like where, and I mean, I've had, you know, I have variations of this discussion. I mean, a few weeks ago I was talking about, you know, the loss of bearings, dementia, losing the landmarks in your life. And I mean, this is adjacent to that conversation, um, like what do you do when these figures that helped you make sense of the world, these reference points, what do you do when they're they're suddenly gone? Um, you know, to, to what extent do you allow that stuff to to encroach on your sense of rightness with the world, your sense of wellness with the world? I suppose. And again, I'm just I'm just thinking I'm thinking in my seat here. I suppose it's this is where the the grief process comes in. This is where an act the acknowledgement comes in. This is where gratitude comes in to to sort of alleviate the shock, to sort of alleviate the the loss. And, you know, I, I say this, I'm speaking the day after um, Sinead O'Connor's funeral, which took place just up the road from Hashtag Blessed in, in Bray. And I looked at those scenes yesterday uh, on the news of all the fans lining up along the seafront in Bray where Sinead O'Connor lived for some time. And they cheered, um, you know, thronged round the hearse. Um, and that's the... That's the um, that's the that's that's the necessary response, um, and it gives people that sense of of doing justice, I suppose, to someone and getting that chance to say goodbye. Which you know, obviously, if you were listening to last week's episode, I spoke about Sinead O'Connor for the first kind of half uh, or or thereabouts of the episode and what she kind of meant, what she meant to me. Um, but it is that that 
idea of saying goodbye is 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 so important um and personally i i think that's that's the path to making accommodations to to making an accommodation with the sense of loss with the sense of less um to go oh the world just got a little bit darker the world just got a bit smaller um something important to me just got extinguished um and you know and it's strange i think it's strange to say that when you're talking about public figures or celebrities or famous people like i had no personal connection obviously to Sinead o'connor or personal connection to william friedkin but this is the nature of art it's the nature of music it's the nature of being a public face how we relate to them how we consume them how we understand ourselves in relation to them um and we all have our own little journey to go on um with these people who we have deemed uh important enough to hold that place in our consciousness um and not everyone does and that's as in not everybody occupies that space in any one person's consciousness like we do select we do select consciously or not we select the people we like we choose the people we like we choose the people who speak to us we choose the people who resonate with us um and for me someone like william friedkin there was something there was something i mean i spoke about Sinead o'connor being ferocious but there's something ferocious and fierce and unapologetic in william friedkin's movie making um you know he was really a director who was willing to go there <laughs> whatever place that was that maybe some other directors would have shied away from um he was willing to go there and without being i feel without being sensationalist or trying to shock um i just feel there was some there was a great sort of artistic hunger and integrity in him uh that you know that that, that informed his his filmmaking um so yeah it, it you know he definitely a big figure a big figure in american movies in hollywood movies and someone who seemed very activated and energized right up until the end by movies i, I heard an interview i'm trying to remember if he i think he was interviewing a movie director there's a nice podcast that the directors guild of america uh, the DGA they put out a, a regular podcast of interviews with filmmakers that take place after the screening of that filmmaker's movie there's a kind of a Q&A Q and interview post screening and William Friedkin was the interviewer uh, for one of those I, you'd have to go back and seek it out I can't remember who he was interviewing like relatively recently the last two or three years and um yeah he was great he just had there was a lot of humor and outspokenness and opinion and just a real as i say just a real kind of vibrancy and vitality and engagement and he was definitely still massively turned on for want of a better phrase uh by movies um and that's what you want i think you want to hear that passion still late in life i mean that's the, the great i think anyway that the, it's the great um privilege of being an art maker when you hear these artists late in life and they're still what's the next thing i'm working on uh, and it's brilliant it's brilliant so anyway william friedkin all the best um yeah go and check out those movies i mean if you're a fan i don't need to convince you and if you're not familiar with his work yeah just go go and watch those ones the french connection the exorcist um cruising to live and die in la and killer joe that wouldn't be a bad that they wouldn't be a bad place to start um and maybe seek out any archive stuff with him as well okay so um there you go um <laughs> i'm laughing i'm laughing because speaking of the importance of goodbyes and farewells um my daughter <laughs> she was going to a friend's this afternoon for a, a play date and we were out together herself myself Kiara, my wife her mother we were out just having a, a 
coffee in nearby Wicklow town and I took Maeve to the library and she had a bit of a <laughs> at the end of her library you know visit she and I had a little um a little uh, argument because she had a couple of books she wanted to return and I was like okay well just go and return them there to the librarian and she just was like no I'm not doing that and I was like what's the problem just go and do it it's no big deal and she really dug her heels in and got very stroppy <laughs> really quickly <laughs> and I, I was like oh man and then I was like no I'm gonna dig my heels in here as well and just try and explain it's okay you can do this it's not a big deal and um it just got really poxy and then um we were joined by my wife and she's like what's going on and i was like uh. <laughs> you know may's just no i'm not doing that and i eventually i took her over to the uh, the you know the the, the self-service uh you know depository whatever check in to drop the books back and we worked it out and it was fine but oh my goodness it torpedoed the little outing um May was in filthy form and you know we were all cranky then and you know Maeve wasn't coming out of her corner at all <laughs> so um we were driving back to to bring her to her friend's house and I knew there was a little uh woodland um walk and it, with a car park that we could pull into and I thought right we'll pull in here just to clear the air and um you know get this sorted out because I, I couldn't bear the thought of uh you know dropping Maeve off at her pals um with us still angry and her still angry um and just with the whole situation unresolved um and I wanted to just take responsibility for for my own part in it um and just make sure you know <laughs> Maeve was you know back in back in good form so we could say goodbye properly uh, when she went to her pals. So we did that and it was kind of grand. Um, and, you know, it's it, it's just tricky. These these rows, these squabbles. And I mean, and I'm not, you've heard me speak again. If you're a regular listener, I speak frequently about my parenting battles. And, um, you know, sometimes my inability to keep my anger under control uh, or my failure to you know to not raise my voice um that kind of thing and i i engage with it very seriously because i i care i care about the kind of father i am i care about the impact on 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 my daughter i care about the impact on myself i care about the impact on my daughter in the future um i mean that's probably my greatest fear that you know that this that this you know when these things happen that that becomes something that shapes her view of men and shapes her view of potential partners if you know if that's the road she goes down later in life um you know that's it's something i worry about um so i always try to own it i always try to own my behavior i always try to get us back to a good place um and it was funny i saw something only in the last few weeks I think it might have just been you know uh, just a little um, you know whatever a tip a parent a bit of parenting advice online somewhere um, I mean, look and by the way maybe not not even just for parenting I mean, it may have been in a parenting context but it's relevant uh, anywhere I think and it was simply it's not the thing that you said that matters it's the thing you said after the thing you said um, or it's not the thing you did that matters it's kind of how you responded after the thing you did and again it seems probably very simple very obvious but to me it's i it just it's, it just it's just stayed with me and lodged in my my feeble brain um and i just think it's actually a really brilliant idea to go okay that wasn't brilliant that wasn't great we lost control of that situation 
how can we get this back and move on with a sense of um yeah i used the word rightness earlier you know with a sense of rightness with a sense of i can continue without hanging on to this i continue i can continue without having added to my burden of shame and guilt um and likewise for my daughter i mean and that was my kind of you know if i have it <laughs> this isn't the day to open up my my list of my own childhood traumas but that that sense of of guilt or shame or confusion that you carry um and maybe a sense of injustice as a kid when you have an angry parent and it's and it goes unresolved or it goes it goes unspoken about i think you know i would have had a lot of experience of that as a child um and as an adolescent as well and i just remember i don't have to go back far <laughs> in my mind or in my emotional memory to go oh yeah i know that feeling and i knew i knew my daughter was upset even even though you know she wasn't in particularly easy form even though she hadn't behaved particularly well um in that moment i tried to go hold on she's the kid you know she's the kid she doesn't have the same equipment that we have and the battle of wills is a very tricky thing it really is isn't it i mean i don't know what your experience is but i find that a very tricky thing when you just get into the out and out two bulls clashing head to head and that is definitely a dynamic that crops up again and again with uh, between myself and my daughter and some days i love it and i mean i'm not saying that from an egotistical point of view i don't relish the fight but some days i love my daughter's fire i love her spirit i love her <laughs> you know her her determination, her sense of, you know, of righteousness um, and her, her quickness to defend herself. I go, oh, this, these are great qualities. These are great qualities. And I hope, I hope she takes them outside the house, outside the family when, you know, when she comes up with someone, who, you know, against someone who um, doesn't love her the way we do um, and wants, you know, doesn't want to care for her the way we do. So, it'll be it'll be put to better use but um yeah yeah look that's all that's all uh, you know i'm laughing because i i recognize the you know i don't know if that falls into parenting fail i'm much more interested in you know i am interested in acknowledging my own parenting fails always but i'm much more interested in um parenting recovery and i think yeah, if you go back to that that little expression I was, t I was t telling you about a moment ago, um, it's not the thing you said, but the thing after the thing you said, that, that, that is most important. And for me, I, what I hear or what I take in when I see that is the idea of recovery. Did you recover that situation? Did you, have you, have you laid the ground to recover the, the relationship um, and make that person in your care feel safe and keep their trust in in the right place um yeah so there you go um okay so one other thing and in a way i feel this i, I won't do this justice but it was just something i saw today that 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 got my my cogs turning and if and when I get my kind of tech set up better organized here at hashtag blessed so I can start having some guests on again, I've, I've kind of, just with the busyness of, of, my, of my life, I've, I've shied away from that this year. Um, I know I interviewed Kiara, my wife, at the start of the year and I haven't really done anything since. Um, so that, you know, I know there's interest out there in more interviews um and as I, i've said it i said it before i have people i know that, that would be happy to be interviewed but i've got a bit of a you know my, my tech phobia and the busyness of life has kept me away from pursuing that i know i have a great person to talk to about the topic i'm about to cover next um and i'm planning to get him on 
at some point but um i'm not going to stay on it for too long i'll just see where it goes it'll probably bring us to the end of, the, of today's episode and it'll be something i'll i'll revisit maybe in interview format um later on in the year but this is what i saw i was on the the guardian um yeah the guardian website earlier today and i was looking at the there was a photo a photo article on Sinead O'Connor's funeral yesterday so I glanced at that and then there was a link to another photo article beside it and it was I can't remember what it was called but it was pregnant trans men and I clicked on that and I learned very quickly that these fathers are known as seahorse dads and it was a photo these were the guardian guardian was showing photos from an exhibition of pregnant trans men um, in water our trans fathers had was at least one with a child in water um you know very um you know, very atmospheric looking shots with kind of greeny turquoisey natural looking water so not you know bath water or swimming pool you know very atmospherically artistically lit quite um i was gonna say stylish i don't mean stylish or stylized but you know with, with a very particular aesthetic um that i guess is meant to invite a sympathetic or um, affectionate gaze um, and I'm not I'm not gonna lie I, I mean I was thrown I mean my first reaction was um, was recoil um, so and again I'm just being completely honest here um, it wasn't disgust but it was sort of shock and I was just looking at my own response going like what is this like what what am i actually responding to here and i was looking at the the you know trying to kind of go okay so what you know what am i actually what am i recoiling from what am what's making me kind of turn my head a little bit or cock my head in confusion and i was thinking to myself okay so the the question being raised is in what kind of body am i used to seeing um the you know the pregnant form and in a human body what kind of body am i used to seeing pregnant and of course the answer is in the female body and i'm just following my own train of thought going so that's you know that's and that's natural so the female body is natural and when i see a male body with a large pregnant belly my brain goes this is unnatural and i think that's the trigger for the recoil to go this is not how it's meant to be and this is i suppose the word i'm going to go for is disturbing now again i'm not saying this is my i'm not saying that this is my end point i'm not saying that this is my conclusion i'm just reporting these were my responses as i looked at these images of of pregnant men and i think i saw a quote from one of the subjects or maybe the artist i'm not sure which saying you know it's not only women who can be pregnant um and that's a challenging idea that's a very, and I find that a confronting idea because again, part of my, um, my straight, <laughs> my straight male brain goes well, and again, I'm going to feed into I think probably a lot of the, um, maybe the the the, the prejudicial language, or the confused language or the confused responses to trans people and i'm not trying to cause offense i'm not trying to be provocative 
I'm not trying to be exclusionary. I'm just reporting my response. And my response was, well, hold on, that's a trans man externally and internally that person has the reproductive system of a woman and I suppose my brain then goes so therefore that's still and again I know I'm stepping into an area here that is potentially going to cause offence but my thinking then is oh so therefore that's not and you know that's not really a man so i mean do you know what i feel like i'm doing here i feel like i'm in that on that show uh qi a question of is it a question of <laughs> is it a question of intelligence or a question of ignorance so that sort of comedy tv uh quiz show on on british television that stephen fry hosted for years and had various comedians and other celebrities on it but anytime somebody said something in response to a question that was sort of apocryphal or the received knowledge that everyone thinks is true you get this you know massive siren blaring to go you know basically you're an idiot that's what everyone thinks and it's the wrong thing and i feel like that's what i'm doing here and i know it i'm doing this knowingly and again i'm trying to you know just ground this or qualify it by going this was earlier today and I was just trying to process <laughs> my thoughts and I'm trying to be very transparent in how I'm, you know, com- communicating my reaction. Um, and with the hope that there'll be an opportunity to explore this with a more informed voice um, at some stage uh, in a future episode of the of, of the show. But um, yeah, that's so. So I was thinking along those lines, and then you know you say that line, but then so then, therefore that's not really a man. And of course, this is at the the heart of I think what trans, you know, what I understand trans people want is accept me, accept me, let me pass as a man, accept me as a man, or accept me as a woman if I'm a trans woman, and let me be who I say I am, or let me be who I know i am or have always felt to be you know inside this body um and i have no problem with that i have no problem with that at all and all i'm doing here as i talk about this is i'm just owning my own reaction and talking it out so i can just examine it and go okay so ultimately is this a form of conservatism and when I say conservatism, I'm not, I'm not speaking politically, but kind of socially um, to be to be conservative, to be conservative is to want things to remain the same. And when when you see a photograph of a pregnant man, that is definitely not the same. And it's not the world as I have known it. And therefore it is confronting and challenging. Um, and see i know you know rationally and intellectually i know that my beliefs and how i view other people and how i view identity and how i review how i how i view personal sovereignty and agency that all of those beliefs i have are tethered to the idea of tolerance and acceptance and people can be whatever the hell they want to be and rationally and intellectually I know I believe that to be true. That's how I feel. So when I see when I saw those images earlier and you realize all your beliefs, you know, what I think are my liberal tolerant beliefs, they're challenged. And I found myself just going on this little thought journey where you go, okay, so what happens? What's the natural end point of this? If I'm opening the door in my mind, in my imagination to go, well, if you're tolerant, what does this look like? If you let this go to its natural conclusion and when it goes to its natural conclusion i go well at some point i'm going to be walking down the street and there'll be a man walking towards me in by himself or as part of a couple as part he could be part of a gay couple he could be part of a you know male and female couple whatever and that man could be pregnant and i'll be like grand how are you how's the <laughs> how's the bump which is, you know, typically how I would greet a female friend who's pregnant. And 
I think that's the that's the journey to go on. For me, that helps me. That helps me go, okay, yeah, grand, of course. Why not? That's if I, you know, because I think we have to get beyond we have to get beyond the the identity stuff. We have to get beyond this is my silo. This is my corner I'm fighting for my tribe, my little my group. Um and again, easy for me to say as a straight white guy who I'm not, I don't feel under attack. And I did hear, um, I did hear recently last week or two weeks ago, I was listening to, um, I was listening to Roisin Ingle of the Irish Times interview, Kathleen Moran, um, who's just written a book about what men need or men's issues or I can't remember. I, I, I might come back to that later. But Roisin Ingle mentioned in the context of that discussion that in Ireland, homophobic attacks are on the rise. And I was really shocked to hear that. Um, and I only mentioned that because in the context of if this particular topic, well, there's no question it does. This particular topic belongs in the ongoing discussion of trans rights, of that particular um that particular group within the LBGTQ community. Um, and it's it just feels like it's a very hot topic um, everywhere. Um, in fact, I heard something else recently. I was talking to my uh, one of my aunts earlier this week um, or late last week, and she was saying that apparently librarians in Dublin are getting a load of grief. People are coming in protesting and giving them abuse because of... Um, of queer books that they're they're providing in their libraries um and i was like are you i, I couldn't believe it so i don't know what bubble i'm living in I'm, I'm living in my bubble in hashtag blessed thinking you know everyone's being thoughtful and considerate um i don't know what the hell i'm thinking but i just think what the hell is wrong with people why you know wh why are people getting angry about that stuff there are so many other things um, that I consider far more deserving of our anger and they have nothing to do with identity and they have everything to do with social equity um, they have everything to do with equal opportunity they have everything to do with healthcare and housing and growing wealth inequality and it's more in the area of you know of economics um, and the failure the failure of, of governments and institutions to serve everyone the failure of wealth to be distributed in a way that would benefit more people um and fundamentally it's 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 my uh my kind of died in the wool socialist instincts they come to the fore and people getting angry about books it's um i'm like what the hell is wrong with you come on direct that anger where it should be directed and don't be having a go at librarians of all people librarians the meekest of us all <laughs> oh my lord oh my lord isn't that unbelievable stuff i okay so look as i said i maybe i should have dedicated the whole episode to this but i'd just be here ranting but i tell you i come i came back if i go back to the seahorse the seahorse dads and this idea of unnatural and I was thinking so this is you know this becomes the rhetoric this becomes the, the the rhetoric or the language of hate and the language of exclusion and ultimately it's the language of dehumanization and if you think of how the the Nazis for example or maybe anti-semites certainly of a certain generation or you know, at certain times in history, how Jewish people or the Jewish race was depicted as verminous uh, or depicted as subhuman, depicted as rats, how black people have been depicted and vilified and dehumanized um, as being ape-like or subhuman. Um, again, I'll throw in just while I'm all on that topic, how you know Irish people in the 1800s in British cartoons political cartoons again depicted as subhuman uh, as ape-like um, as primitive the way people of color indigenous people historically have been depicted that way in fact i was listening to 
a very interesting podcast earlier today. Um, if you find the Big Picture podcast um, presented by Sean Fennessy and Amanda Dobbins, typically they have a series at the moment by one of their colleagues from the the Ringer Network, and he's doing a history of um, the the Vietnam War as dealt with in Hollywood movies. Um, so it's a little series. Uh, so it's a, it's a break from the normal kind of course of business. Um, but I listened to the first episode of that today, which was really interesting. And one thing in it was a, a clip um, from a, I think it was from the documentary Hearts and Minds, which won the best documentary Oscar back in whatever it was, the early 70s or late, it must have been early 70s. Um, and it was an interview with the commanding general of the US Army in Vietnam and it was just a very brief clip of him describing I think did he use the word primitive he's talking with the Vietnamese people and basically saying how they they don't put the same value on life as Westerners do or as Americans do um, and that's 50 years ago that's not the 1800s you know that's not the you know the height of um you know the height of sort of the the colonial uh, period of 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 history that's 50 years ago which I, which I would consider relatively recent history um and i think this is something we need to be very wary of um and something that i think is worth challenging when we relegate certain members of society and dehumanize them. And you've just got to think, well, who am I aligning myself with if I give myself permission to do that? Um, because if I start responding in that way, um, it's very natural. If I, if I open the door to that, I'm closing the door on those people. And I'm saying, well, if they're not human in the way I understand humanity, then they don't get the same rights. They're not entitled to what I'm entitled to. Um, and so I was just trying to catch myself quickly today and go, okay, let me look at this response. What's, where does this lead me? What does this do to challenge what I believe or what I say I believe? Or what I feel I know I believe. Um, and am I willing to just have a look at my response and see what that's about? Um, and that's that's where I, I ended up going. Um, that, that ended up being my, my sort of, um, my lesson to myself, I suppose. Or my kind of sense of, okay, so that's really what that's about then. If I'm allowing myself to use language like unnatural um then that becomes the language of dehumanization uh and so my 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 conclusion ultimately is is kind of get with the program you know society is changing fast and you know it just seems that if certain things certain things have become and again this is broadly speaking you know if we say certain things have become broadly more acceptable um or the broadening of that acceptance led to um legislative acceptance and so for for example um if you think gay marriage or you know civil marriage or whatever it is you know, it's become legal in so many parts of the world. And you go, oh, well, brilliant, that's good. Because, you know, gay people have been fighting for generations to try and get equal rights. And why shouldn't they? Um, and f I think I think what people do is they kind of go, well, OK, you know, we, we, we've taken care of that. That was a bit prickly, wasn't it? We, we, you know, but we've we've let them have that. So, you know, everyone just kind of be quiet now and, and don't rock the boat. But then trans people are like, well, hold on a second. You know, we're not that. We're something else. And we ha we want to be seen and given, you know, our corner as well. We want the same accommodations to be made for us. 
and people are like well hold on sure look did we not didn't we, did, didn't we not just give you that can you not just stay quiet and be happy you know because you kind of you, you got the nod there is that not enough and you know what it isn't that's the simple truth we've just got to get on with it and go this is the changing nature of the world and there has been an acceleration and instead of being afraid of it why don't we just welcome it why don't we just welcome it and make things bloody easier for people who've had a really hard time anyway um and certainly you know that that thing that roshi and ingle said that homophobic attacks are on the rise you don't want to be part of that i don't want to be part of that <laughs> do you you don't we've got to find a way to live faster with our discomfort to get to a better place with our discomfort um and that helps it just helps pave the way for more integration more acceptance more tolerance i don't think it's easy i don't think it's straightforward but the faster we can go do you know what humans we're messy we're complex it's really bloody tricky and there are people who who put us onto our heels a bit who make us rock back a bit who challenge our preconceptions who challenge our our sense of control of how we understand the world who challenge our sense of this is how it should be it just isn't as we want it to be it isn't nice and neat it's lumpy it's lumpy okay it's not homogenous it's lumpy we've got to accept it we've got to accept it we can't just take our brush and go Poof. now everyone's the same we're not we're not the same we're the same in our complexity we're the same in our contradictions we're the same in our in our dysfunction and our madness and our 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 own crises and our own yearning just to kind of get through i'll go back to what i said at the start to get through this thing called life yeah to quote prince <laughs> so um do you know what seahorse dads let's do it let's do it let's just bring it on and it is what it is um it is what it is the world is changing fast it, it's on all of us to to try and keep an open mind you know that is and, and that is ultimately that is one of my other big fears i spoke about you know my fears for my, my, my daughter and the impact of parenting fails but for myself one of my fears is that i'll become completely rigid and inflexible in my thinking in my opinions and i won't be able to accommodate a shred of difference a shred of deviation and i just think that that road leads to an atrophied soul withered shriveled stuck and unreachable i don't want that for myself maybe you want it for yourself i mean that's your right <laughs> off you go okay so there you go um that's uh whatever an hour and 15 minutes to take us from billy friedkin to parenting fails to seahorse dads and to resisting the language of dehumanization i hope that all held together i will talk to you again next week thank you so much for listening if you are a regular listener, brilliant, brilliant. I'm very grateful. If you're a new listener, even more brilliant. Thank you for taking a chance. Thank you for choosing this podcast. And um, yeah, you. if you liked what you heard, if you like what you hear, throw me some love on social media if you can be bothered. You'll find those links there wherever you're listening to this. You can throw me love uh, across the platforms. Uh, Twitter, I don't use very much. Uh, Twitter, now X, because Elon Musk is a complete megalomaniac, egomaniac, narcissist. Um, you can find me there on YouTube. Uh, YouTube. 
YouTube and Instagram and Facebook. Um, yeah, comments, shares, recommends, ratings, reviews, all that stuff is good. All that stuff helps. Uh, you can email me at theclearoutlive at gmail.com if you wish uh, to share thoughts, to make suggestions, whatever. And of course, if you want to get behind this independent podcast and add your financial heft to the ongoing efforts of the clear out you can do so using the patreon link that's the clear out podcast um on patreon patreon.com forward slash the clear out podcast yeah so that's it thanks again thanks for listening i'll catch you again next week go forth mind yourselves stay safe all the best see you bye